and they switch it out. Okay. So I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Well, we'll pray that God will, he will hear you and you won't need none of that. Amen? Yeah, amen. Amen. Okay. I'm glad that you're okay. I mean, you can talk. You can hear. Thank you. You're, you're I appreciate country, it. You know? So yeah. We got to get you home. Amen? As fast as possible. Amen. Let's, let's say a prayer for him, Brother Tony. Yes, God. Okay, Father, Father we just come I before you, Lord God. Yeah. We come before you, Lord Father, as servants of God. Yes, Lord. We stand in the gap right now, God, for Guy, oh, Lord Father. We pray, yes. oh God, that they may find what's wrong, Lord God. Yes. But even before then, Lord God, we want to pray for a miracle, God. A healing touch, Lord. A healing touch, Lord God, because I can't be there physically, oh God. Yes, but that Lord. doesn't matter, oh God. Because as Thank Jesus you. said, my word has been, his word was sent, and yes. the Roman centurion's servant was healed. And yes, so, Lord. Father, we pray, oh, Lord God. And your scripture Lord. says in the Gospel of John that greater works yes, will be Lord. done after his resurrection. So, Father, we pray, oh, God, right now in the name of your son, Jesus, that you send your spirit of healing upon, upon God, God, Lord God. Right now as we speak, Lord God, as we come Thank together you. as your servants, oh, God, Thank you, Lord. May your healing take place, Lord Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Pastor. Amen. 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 The Lord God. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So I'm glad that we that Tony opened us in a word of prayer. You want to jump right in here, Tony? Is okay? Yeah, so absolutely. Okay, so what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna review what I spoke about last week, real quick, okay? That way it keeps it fresh in our mind. Last week we spoke on the biblical location of where the gifts of the Holy Spirit are located, right? And in three places, basically. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11. Romans 12, 6 to 8. And Ephesians 4, 11 to 12. Those are the three places. And we did an exegesis on it, on the scripture verses in the original language, in the Greek. And we discovered a couple of things. Number one, that... Concern, we, we have to be concerned for spiritual gifts. We just can't have our lack, lackadaisical attitude towards it because Jesus said for us to seek the gifts, to seek the gifts of, so we can come and have the power we need for our lives. Back down. You can't get out of bed. I'm sorry, Angel. That's okay. I'm going to mute, I'm gonna mute my down. mic. Okay. You got uh, something's on the mic. I can't see you. Something's uh, blocking your face. Oh, that's me. I'm sorry. Forgive me that's about that. Okay. No, he had something in front of the camera. Is he okay now? Okay. So uh, we have to have a concern for the spiritual gifts. That way we will have the power of God in our lives to just function normally. Listen to me. You need power to function normally. Okay? If you don't have the, the, the power, you can't even function as a Christian normally. All right? Because we are what? We are brethren, which means coming from the same womb. And we got, uh, we, wanna, we don't want to be ignorant. We want to be carried away with our dumb idols of our life we spoke about. And also that these dumb idols will lead us nowhere. And we got to be careful that even people in our lives can become our idols. We also learned that no one can say that Jesus the Lord is accursed if they are saved and have the Holy Spirit. Uh, what else? Uh, of the living God inside of them. We studied that we are that there are diversities of gifts, but the same Holy Spirit that Holy gives Spirit. us the differences of ministry to the same Lord. Also, that there are diversities of activities to the same God. So it's the same Spirit, the same Lord, and the same God that are doing this work in us. We spoke about that each of us is, is giving a spiritual gift to the profit of us all. It's not the gift for me, for my sake. It's the, God using the gift through me for my brothers, my sisters, and the people of God, or, and the unsaved. What else? We spoke about the gift of the word of wisdom. We also spoke about the gift of the word of knowledge. We spoke about the gift of faith. We spoke about the gifts of healing. We spoke about the working of miracles and the discerning of different spirits. And we discovered that there are different kinds of tongues and that there are interpretations of tongues, not translations of tongues. Translation is from one known language to a known language. 
Interpretation is from an unknown language to a known language. That way you can clarify that. What else? Okay, let's begin. That was the review for last week. In case you missed it, that was two hours in about a minute and a half. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, part two. We're going to go to the book of Genesis first, real quick. Genesis 1 1, the first scripture. Actually, in the Hebrew, it's only seven words. Now, Hebrew, in the beginning, God, Elohim, that's what it means in Hebrew, the supreme God, the magistrate God, the mighty God created. So, yeah, and that word create is an interesting word. It means to cut down, like you cut down a tree. So God cut down the chaos and made beautiful things, planets and trees and birds and everything else, okay? It also means to process. You see, creation is a process. There's an instant appearance of something, but then that thing it become, it falls into the process of creation. It, it has a seed after its kind. It grows. It flourishes. It has flowers, etc. And it says that God created the heavens, plural, because there are three heavens in scripture. Everybody knows that, yeah? The first heaven is the air, the air around the earth. That's called the first heaven. The second heaven is outer space where the planets are. And the third heaven is where God is. That's why Paul says in the book of uh, 2 Corinthians, I believe it is 12, God took him up to the third heaven and showed him mysteries, wonderful things in heaven, and then sent him back so he can minister to the people of God, the body of Christ. And in verse 2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And look now, here it is, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God is, is seen. So right here in, in the beginning of Genesis, you see the Father, God, the Creator, right? Elohim. And then you see the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters. And the picture in the Hebrew is like, uh, uh, like if it had wings. Like if it was a bird, like if it was a hummingbird or a dove or something like that. Now, don't get it twisted, but on many pictures you see Jesus coming out of the water when he was baptized, and you see a little bird over his head. That's not the Holy Spirit, that bird, okay? The scripture says it was like a dove. Yes. But what we do is we put in a dove. Yes. In fact, there's a ministry that has a, a dove on, on as his logo. But the Holy Spirit is not a bird. The Holy Spirit is a spirit, but it's also a person. We'll get to that later. Amen. So the spirit is hovering over the waters. So then you got the father and the son and the Holy Spirit. But where's Jesus in the scripture? He's found in verse three. Then God said, let there be. Okay. Let there be what? He said, let there be light. light. Now in that word, let there be in Hebrew is only one word. And it means let it exist. Let it become. Let it come to pass. Let it go. Let it follow. Let it be emphatic. Let it become. Let it be all together. Let it be accomplished. Let it be committed. Let the breaking happen before the thing begins. Let the cause, the first cause happen. Let it, let it be required of everybody. Let it literally have breath. The let it be is almost like bringing the breath on creation. Now, the Bible says in John chapter 1 that in the beginning was what? The Word. The Word. And the Word was with God, God. and the Word was God. So here in the words, let there be, that's the theophany of Christ. Why? Mm -hmm. Because he's the Word. And the Word created. Logan. So here you see the Trinity right there in Genesis chapter 1. You see the Father creating, you see the Holy Spirit hovering, and you see the let there be making everything happen. That's Christ. He's the let there be in your life. Amen? So now we're going to go to the book of Joel real quick. And found in the Old Testament. They call him one of the minor prophets, but there ain't nothing minor about this prophet. Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. If I'm going too fast, please slow me down, okay? It's God's Spirit poured out in this chapter. It says in verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I, God speaking, will pour out my spirit, Hebrew, one word. The spirit will be spilled forth. It will be poured like a libation on an altar. It will be come out like almost like liquid. It's going to be also solid at the same time, my spirit. In fact, the word means that my spirit is going to mount up. It's going to mount up. It's going to expand itself. It's going to bring life and soul and compliance to creation. It's going to sprawl out. It's going to be cast out. It's going to be gushed out. It's going to be shed out. It's going to be uh, almost like bleeding out. It's going to be fruitful out. It's going to be like a spark. But it also means in the Hebrew, a spark that is worthy. So God's spirit is going to come out like a spark, lighting a fire. Okay? 
And it says, the my, pour my spirit on all flesh. That means every created person. Okay? Not on animals. The Holy Spirit never fell on animals. The Holy Spirit fell on, fell on people. And this is an interesting word in the Hebrew because this means the body, the person, or what is fresh. And it also means your most intimate part of your body. Even on that, God is poured out his spirit on our bodies. See? That's why our bodies as men, we have to keep them holy. That's why we can have sexual imp impurity. That's why we can't come and, and, and act, do acts of carnality because it, it, it stops the Holy Spirit from working in our lives. So, because why? Because God poured it out on a vessel he called flesh. The vessel is flesh, but the spirit is, comes within. So we have our spirit that gives us life and the Holy Spirit. So there are two spirits living in every Christian that is born again. Any questions? No. Okay. So, so then after that, it says, oh, this word is interesting. It not only is the most intimate part of, of, of people, but it also means that God literally, it says, and your sons and daughters, right? Your, your sons and daughters will what? Will prophesy. We'll prophesy. Your old man will dream dreams. Your young man will see visions. See, the spirit, when it falls on you, something happens. Afterward, you can see the spiritual. Afterward, you can truly see what God wants you to see because you're looking through God's eyes. That's why we have to have uh, a discipline about ourselves and, and not be in a state of sin and, and try to, to see the things of God because it will be prevented. Okay? It says, you shall dream dreams, you young men. And it says, also, on my men servants, that means my sons. Listen to gentlemen, brothers. God is speaking about the male. The, the place of the male. Here it is. My sons, he calls you. And it means in the Hebrew, the builders of family. So men are called by God when the spirit falls on them to build a family, to be the builder of your own family. That includes your wife and children and grandchildren and your other relatives, your brothers, your sisters, etc. But it also means this. It has to do with relationship. It has to do with, with nations. See, it's God pours his spirit on you and you, if you, if you believe it, you can affect nations. Absolutely. You can affect ages. You can be the anointed of the Lord. You can do good things. You can bring glad tidings. You can bring the announcements of God. You can show forth. You can bring and carry the things of God to others. That's why the Spirit is given. It says not only are my men servants, but are my, my maid servants, my daughters, my female daughters, because they're the ones that supply descendants. You see, descendancy comes from the female, right? Because she gives birth. So that's, that's why she's important. And it says, and I will pour out my Spirit. And this is interesting because this is the second time in the scripture that he uses the phrase. See, in the beginning he says, I will pour out my spirit. And then he says it a second time in the scripture. There is a study of Bible numerology and typology. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Studying mm. the names of scripture and studying the numbers in scripture. And when you study the numbers of scripture, they have meaning. Everything in the Bible that is written by the Holy Spirit has meaning. Now, whenever something is mentioned a second time in a particular scripture... Two is the number in scripture of witness. Why do I say that? Moses said, let everything be established out of the mouth of two witnesses. Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'm witnessing. I'm in the midst. So whenever you hear something twice, whenever something is said two times, God, the Holy Spirit is always saying, look, I'm going to pour out my spirit. Right. God says, and the, the spirit is going to witness about the spirit. Just like God searches the deep things of God, see, through moans and, and utterings, right? The, the God searches himself to see if he's really worthy himself. How much more should I search myself? And that's the job of the Holy Spirit. He searches me, points out my sins, brings me to repentance so I can be back in order so he can use me. Amen? So now it's going to go to another scripture. So remember that anytime something's mentioned twice, it always speaks of witnessing. And now we're going to go to, to what this is. Joel is the Old Testament. It's predicting the pouring of the Spirit. Now we're going to go to Acts chapter 2 when the Spirit showed up on Pentecost. That's Acts chapter 2, verse 16 to 18. The Apostle Peter. But this is what is spoken by the prophet Joel, Peter says, after the Spirit fell on them in Pentecost in the upper room. 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. He's repeating what Joel said. That I will pour out. Now in the Greek, 
This pour out is not one word like in the Hebrew, it's two words. And it means to bring, pour forth, okay? Also to bestow, to give, to confer. See, the Holy Spirit was donated. The Holy Spirit was presented. That's what it means. The Holy Spirit was imparted. The Holy Spirit was gushed out on Christian believers. The Holy Spirit ran almost on top of, this, top of them. It was spilled forth. It also comes from the Holy Spirit spilled forth for action. It spilled forth for motion in the Greek. It spilled forth so we can proceed. It spilled forth to give us a cause to be. It spilled forth to give direction. It spilled forth so we can go beyond our experiences. It spilled forth heartily and abundantly, and it was high above. See, it was spilled not from down throwing up. It was from up throwing down. So it could splash and completely fill us. And it says, the spirit of my God, of my, of my spirit, that's God's spirit. And that's Greek. The Greek word for spirit is pneumos, pneuma. And pneuma is a, it's an interesting word. It means, it's always like, it, 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 when you think of it, it's motion. Something's happened. Just like he was hovering over the waters in Genesis, the spirit is always moving, see? So it gives a, a type of movement to it. And it says here, uh, pneuma, a breath, a, a blast, a breeze. It means a, a vital principle. The Holy Spirit comes like as a vital principle, see, as a disposition with a temperament, with, with an inclination, with a tendency, with a nature, with a life, with a mind that is God's. And it says on, on who? On all. On all who believe the Spirit is available. All forms. And this is an interesting word. It means declension or descent. See, the Spirit, no matter how you feel about things, the Holy Spirit wants to bring you up, not put you down. Because why? Because God is the lifter of my head. God is not going to put, put me down. He's going to bring me up. So I'm getting up something in front of me. Okay. And it says there uh, that God takes, to, takes you from a situation where things are worsening to a thing situation when things are made whole. Daily, evermore, thoroughly. And it's available to whosoever. And then now here we come with the first, on all what? On all flesh. Just like in the Old Testament, the word flesh. This word is interesting. In the Greek, it's sarks. It means this. I will pour out my flesh of everybody who's stripped of their skin. Think about that. Why? Because the flesh, you see, the covering on my body, the flesh itself that my mind tells to sin. See, God says when his spirit comes upon you, it's like if he took all your skin off, okay? He took off all your skin, all your carnality, see, to pour in his spirit. Because that's done on a spiritual level. So God strips you of your skin, so to speak, like an animal with, no, with, the, with the meat showing. Okay? And by extension, it's the body. Also, it's the human nature. Why? God wants to fill the human nature, our frailties, you see, and our physical and moral passions and our carnality. He wants us to give that up so that he can move. Because why? Because he is a spirit. And those who worship him, worship him in spirit. And in truth, and this is a message that your flesh will always get in the way of the spirit. My flesh wants to do this, but the spirit wants me to do this. And so that's the, 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 the dilemma that I face in this vessel. Now I'm at war, Paul says, with my body, right? My body wants to do this. My spirit wants to do that. When the spirit wins, I'm happy. When the body wins, I'm tribulated. Now I got to deal with shame. Now I got to deal with guilt. Now I got to deal with denial. Now I got to deal with all this stuff, okay? So that's uh, what else, okay? So that's the carnal-minded thing. God wants you to get rid of that. And, and the word in Greek is interesting. It comes from words that mean this. God wants to come into your vessel and sweep away everything that doesn't belong. It's like you take the skin off, off a penil, right? Of a pig, right? And then you season it. So God wants to sweep everything out so he can season you, see? God has to put some adobo on some of you. Some of you have to put some salt. Some of you need some jalapenos to get you moving, you know? So God has all these spiritual things to give you, all these ingredients, see? Because God's the cook and I'm the waiter, hallelujah, you see? So it's all okay. So let God do that. And then it says, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall dream dreams. And then he goes on, and my mate and on my mate, men servants, 
These are the sons, the immediate sons, the kinfolk, okay? And on my maidservants, my daughters, my descendants again, here it is again, a second mention. I will pour out, see? I, I, in those days, see, in those days, in those days. Now, in the, in the Old Testament, in Job, it ends there. But Peter adds an attachment, an addendum to it. And he says, and they shall prophesy. The second mention of prophecy, again, witnessing to what God wants us to do. Move in the prophetic anointing. Move with a prophetic word. Why? Because the spirit is speaking through you. When you move in a prophetic ability, like Peter says here, it's witnessing to the power of God in your life. Amen? Next scripture we're going to go to real quick. 2 Corinthians 3, chapter 3, and, uh, verse 3 and 6. Why? Because the Holy Spirit makes us ministers. Amen? See, he's going to come upon me. He's going to empower me. He's going to give me gifts. And he's going to make me a minister. That's the point, to be a minister. Now, I know some of you might be a reluctant minister, and that's okay, because God was going to have his way anyway. Okay? So, 2 Corinthians 3, 3 and 6. It says, Paul speaking, clearly you are an epistle. Now, one of the guys, when I was in Bible school, they asked what an epistle was, and he raised his hand. He said it was the wife of an apostle. It's not. An epistle is not the wife of an apostle, okay? An epistle just means a letter, okay? It's not the wife of an apostle. Uh, uh, brother, brother Tony, Nisi is not your what? Okay? She, she, the, the pistol is not she, she's my okay? pistol. They're your pistol. There you go. Okay, good. So clearly you are an epistle. And that means in Greek, a written message, a letter, a letter in writing. See, God puts his, his words in writing. See, so you can't argue with it. It's there in writing. It's not just an oral tradition we have. And it means to communicate, to bring purpose, okay, to touch with your words. It means to superimpose your thoughts what you're thinking with God's words. God wants to put his words at the cap of, of your intelligence. At, he wants to climb through your mind. He wants to cover. He wants to ascend. He wants to protect. He wants to scale. He wants to cloak you. He wants to put a crest on you as an epistle. He wants to crown you. Why? Because he's going to reinforce you like a roof that's broken. He wants to surmount you, okay? Why? So you can be at the apex or the summit of your power in Christ. And it says behind, be, besides or behalf. And now it says of Christ and ministers. Diakonos, that's the word. Diakonos. It means an attendant to wait upon. And this is an attendant that does menial work. But they say in Acts chapter 7, we want men filled with the Holy Spirit. And what do we want them for? To wait on tables. Okay. You know, God gives you something. Let's say God says oh, to, to me to tell you something and you don't like the message I give you. Don't come to me and argue. I'm the waiter. I'm not the cook, okay? God is the cook. If you don't like the food, talk to him, not me, okay? I just deliver the food. Hey, I'm coming. The message is, I'm giving you this message right now about the Holy Spirit. What you do with it, you should eat it. But if you don't like it and you don't want to eat it, don't complain to the waiter, complain to the cook. He's the, he's the cook, not me. Okay, by us written, not, not with the ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh. And verse four, the spirit, not the letter. And we have such trust through God towards, Christ towards God. And it says in verse five, not that we are sufficient. We are not sufficient by ourselves. In the Greek, that's hikanos. It means not that we have arrived. Oh, hallelujah. Guess what? Angel Sapata has not arrived. I've been serving the Lord almost 40 years but I haven't got there, brothers, okay? I have not, I'm not sufficient. You see, hallelujah. It means, it also means when you, you are sufficient, it means you're competent. That means you come into season in the Greek. It means there's enough ample things in you that, that you fit, that you have the character, that you're able, that you're content, that you're enough, okay? See, I'm never enough, but God is enough, hallelujah. And God in me is the hope of glory. So it means to get large. It means to be, to be secure, to find yourself worthy, see? So that's about ourselves, to think of anything as being from ourselves. But our sufficiency, second time it's mentioned, is witnessing again. God, the Holy Spirit is witnessing about sufficiency, that he is the sufficient one. My God is sufficient. Why? Because he's all-powerful. 
Sí. Omnipotent. That's why he's sufficient. In my insufficiency, he's sufficient. Verse 6, who also made us sufficient. Third mention. That means the Trinity is talking to you. The Father says, the Son says, and the Holy Spirit says, sufficiency, sufficiency, sufficiency. I'm your sufficiency. That's why I send my spirit. Now, John chapter 16 talks about the Holy Spirit's work. John chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. Those other uh, scriptures I gave you were from the King James, the uh, New King James. And it says, verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth, the spirit giving, the, the truth giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth. That's what the spirit does. The whole, the full truth. For he will not speak his own message, but he will tell whatever he hears from the father. He will give the message that has been given to him and he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come. See, what will happen in the future? Verse 14, he will honor and glorify me. See, that's Jesus and the father, right? Because what? He will take or receive and draw upon what is mine, Jesus is saying, and will we reveal it, declare it, disclose it, transfer it, transmit it to you. Amen? So now let's recap. What does the Holy Spirit want from you? What does the Holy Spirit want for you this day? Number one, the Holy Spirit wants to give you gifts. But in order for you to appreciate the gifts, you must learn who is giving you the gift, where mm -hmm. it's coming from, okay? We saw, we spoke about the wrapping behind the First Corinthians chapter 12. Now, what you find after you take the wrapping off, you find the Holy Spirit is there. And this Holy Spirit has things to give you. He's coming with presence. He's coming with things for you, okay? And the Holy Spirit does not give leftovers, amen? The Holy Spirit will not come and give you yesterday's stuff. He's going to give you the stuff you need for today. He's going to give you tomorrow what you need for tomorrow. He's going to give you with next week what you need for next week. And for next year, what you need for next year. And on the day you die, he's going to give you what you need for that day too. Amen? So, and the Holy Spirit gives you a, com not leftovers, but a complete feast. Diversity mm -hmm. of gifts. Differences of administration. You see, it's a feast. You're going to a feast. The Bible says we're going to have a feast in heaven, but we can have a feast down here if we let the Holy Spirit use us in the gifts. So the Holy Spirit functions and works through human beings. A lot of people don't get that. They think the Holy Spirit is something moving somewhere else or doing this or go over there. No, the Holy Spirit is someone who functions in me, in my life. He takes this brain, this heart, this soul, and he works through it. And that's why he works differently through me than he does through you or through somebody else. And the Holy Spirit knows all of our problems. Thank God. See, the Holy Spirit is not your therapist. You don't go to him and ask for medications and for, for guidance that way. You know what I mean? The Holy Spirit is not that. The Holy Spirit comes and says, I will solve your problem if you let me. Let me in so I can do this. And the Holy Spirit has all of the answers that we all need. Why? Three things. The Holy Spirit is interested in you. The Holy Spirit wants to be intimate with you. And the Holy Spirit wants to include you. Those are the three things. The Holy Spirit is interested in you. He wants to be intimate with you. And he wants to include you in his holy, perfect plan. I know some of y'all are saying, why little old me? Take that up with God. Moses said, I stutter. Uh, what was it? Gideon said, I can't do this. You see, someone else said, I'm not worthy. But God says, no, see, you, everybody sees a kid, but I see a king. Everybody sees a ghetto rat, but I see a great man. Every sees, every, everybody sees a former adulterer, but I see a man who will move excellently with the power of my spirit. That's why, he's, it, that's why he wants to be intimate. That's why he wants to include you. See, the Holy Spirit wants to show you your sins. That's how he begins. So what? So you can face your sins and repent and he can get to work in your life. Amen. The Holy Spirit saves. Hallelujah. For the spirit of God that saves. Oh, thank God. See, the Holy Spirit wants you to be born again. You have to be born again to understand the spiritual things. The Holy Spirit wants you to love God's word. I meet Christians all the time. They hate reading the Bible. Then they wonder why there's no power in their life. Amen. Then they wonder why they can't hear God's word. 
and then they wonder why they're depressed or they keep falling into that same sin over and over and over again because they don't like reading God's word. You have to love God's word. And the Holy Spirit wants you to pray. And you have to, you have to not only really love God's word, you have to love praying. I don't know if I told this class that they asked me one time, how often do you pray? I say, uh, I, they say, I, I say, I pray about it. Uh, they ask me, how long do you pray? And I said, I can only pray for about 20 minutes. And then the guy said, well, how long do you pray? I said, every 20 minutes. You know what I mean? That's how we got to pray. You see, I pray, I can only pray five minutes. You say, okay, then pray every five minutes. And then you start, on, get the love for the word, get the love for prayer. And another thing, get a love of worship. I go to churches where no one wants to raise their hands because they feel embarrassed. Let us lift up holy hands and magnify the Lord and worship him. That's a scripture. Why? Because the up straight, the hands like this, what does it mean? It means I surrender. And when I surrender, God fights for me, see? When I give up, when I come to him in humility, I say, I can't do this, Lord. This is too hard. I don't know how to love people. I, I got a bad temper. I, I always pick the wrong woman. I always do the wrong thing. And God says, good, lift, lift your hands a little higher, a little higher, and I surrender. And when I do that, God fights for me. Hallelujah. Also, the Holy Spirit wants your praises. I see people in church, they won't sing if you slap them in the back of the head, okay? <laughs> if you gave them earmuffs and put them in virtual reality with an orchestra, they still wouldn't sing. See, God puts a song in your heart, see? God puts a worship in your heart. God puts a praise in your heart. Well, start thinking about the sins he took you from. If that don't put you to praising, something's wrong somewhere, then you're ungrateful and you need to repent. And the Holy Spirit, why does he want you to read the word? Why does he want you to pray? Why does he want you to worship? Why does the Holy Spirit want you to, pr to praise him? Because that will bring healing into your life. All kinds of healing. Spiritual, mental, physical, emotional. See, the Holy Spirit wants you to become a disciple, a follower. And the Holy Spirit wants to, you to win souls and to make other disciples. Amen. The Holy Spirit wants you to advance to, from discipleship to what? To stewardship. See, so you want to become a steward of the things of God. That means like a supervisor. Like someone who's taking care of something for the Lord. Like organizing. See, someone who's moving in a different, in a different place. From a disciple, from a leader, from a, from a follower, you become a leader who builds leaders. You see, every leader, each one teach one. You know what I mean? I, I as a leader, I disciple men. And then I released these men to disciple other men. When I had a group in, in, in uh, uh, I had a couple of groups in New York City when I was there with the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. And I had a group of men. And when I left to move to South Carolina, I uh, appointed someone to take my place. And that was three years ago. That group is still active. That group is still there. They're still being discipled. Now they're being discipled by the person that I left. And then he's in contact with me, you see? Even though I moved all the way down here, I still disciple him in New York. I'm still pouring into him. That's what, what, what you as a leader, we are men. We are called to do that. We are called to lead. We are called to build people so that they can build people. Make sense? The Holy Spirit wants to give you and use you in the many gifts that he offers and he gives. He's the giver. The Holy Spirit wants to make your character, listen to me, gentlemen, into the character of Christ. He doesn't want you to become a better person. See, you go to all these people in the world, they say, I'm going to help you to become a better person. And what you discover is you don't become a better person. You know, a, a, a monkey in a tuxedo is still a monkey, okay? You know, a person that's lustful, you can put a, a, a crown on him, he's still a lustful person with a crown on. So God wants you what? I want you to develop, Jesus says, my character. I want you to decrease, Jesus says, so I can increase. John chapter 8. Unless a, a seed falls to the ground and die, no life can come forth. So that's what Jesus said. We have to develop the character of Christ. I have to be able to look at you, brothers, right in the eyeball. And you got to show me Jesus. See? And if you're not showing me Jesus and you're showing me you, you failed. So what characteristics is God dealing with you in your life that's making your character like him? Or are you resisting that? as men. The Holy Spirit, see, is omniscient. That means what? He's all-knowing. There's nothing he doesn't know. The Holy Spirit is omnipotent, all-powerful. When I can't, God can. 
And when I can, God still can, even more than I can. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is everywhere. And the Holy Spirit, lastly, the conclusion is this, that I discovered in studying the Holy Spirit. He is what? A person. The Holy Spirit has a personality. You can grieve him. You can resist him. See? He has feelings. You see, like us. Where do you think we got our feelings from? Love. How can I love if I had no feelings? I spent 30 years of my life not loving myself. See? Jesus said one of the two greatest commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And love your neighbor as who? I can't tell you how many men I've counseled in 40 years who didn't love themselves. Show me a man with an addiction of any kind, and I'll show you a man who doesn't love himself. Because if you love yourself, you wouldn't have the addiction. You understand what I'm saying to you? And I take that from my own life from being on drugs, from being in the street, from being in gangs, from being in war, from being hostile, from being an atheist. The bottom line was I didn't love me. And in Christ, I've had to learn that I didn't love myself the first day I became a Christian. 40 years later, I'm still in the process of loving me. Because why? Because I can't give what I don't have. If I don't love me, how am I going to love some of you? Because some of y'all I'm going to give you a word now from the Lord. You're hard to love. Can I get an amen from somebody? Amen. I know you're hard to love. I know it. Okay. And lastly, not only is the Holy Spirit a person, but the Holy Spirit is God. He is God. Think about that. God wants to inhabit me. Oh, my God. I better clean the house, you know. You know, some, you, sometimes you go to somebody's house and the wife says, so-and-so's coming over. We got to clean up. And you're like, why should we clean up for? He's my friend for 30 years. Yo, we got to clean the house. See? Good impression, right? Especially if a mother-in-law's coming over, okay? You better clean that house, okay? Because she starts saying, yo, this dirt here, what's this? What kind of wife you have? So, 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 so tear you to pieces, okay? I love my mother-in-law, though. She's a good woman. And, and what else? Now, are there any questions about what I've said so far on the Holy Spirit from anybody? Yes. My brother, uh, Guy. Your, your mic is off. Yes. So uh, we were just talking about cleaning cleaning the house. Yes. And, and maybe I'm wrong in, in asserting this, but I kind of felt like the, the Holy Spirit has been cleaning my house because Good. I couldn't Praise do God. it. Right? Praise God. Brother. I mean, that's, that, that's what, I, what I've been thinking, that I couldn't clean my house. So he had to clean my house. Praise God. That's absolutely so, brother. Yes. And, and we let him. See, if I'm going to try to take the broom from the Holy Spirit, he's going to say, let me clean. I clean better than you. No, no, let me help you. Let me get another broom. God says, no, I got this. I can do this better than you. See, I can clean you better than you can clean you. We only clean the outside. <laughs> God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, cleans the inside. God showed me how to love again. You don't know, man. I went 30 years fighting depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. And fighting with police officers. Grabbed the policeman's gun one time. I was with a girl or a girl that a friend of mine in the car. We were just talking, just friends. It was at night. The cop came, shining a flashlight through the window. And I rolled down the window. I said, yo, get that flashlight off me. I didn't know who he was. And I saw he was a police officer. He said, what are you doing here? I said, what do you mean what I'm doing? I'm talking to my friend. And then he said, this ain't no, and he cursed hotel. Now, I felt being a Puerto Rican man, you know, we have to defend our women, even our friends. So I said, what did you say? He said, you heard me. And I said, I, I, and I, I said, I stepped out of the car. When I stepped out of the car, he said something to me. I said something to him. And then he grabbed me by my neck. And then I went MMA on him. Okay? When he got me by my neck, I took this hand and pinched his hand. When I pinched his hand, I reached behind his crotch underneath and grabbed his belt. And I do a pile driver is in wrestling. I pile drive him right into the, to the concrete. And so he came up dizzy with a gun and he put it on me. And then I grabbed the gun and I put it like this. Now the girl is screaming. The cop is screaming. He's calling for a backup, right? And I'm moving forward and I'm telling him, shoot me, shoot me, shoot me if you're a man. And he, and he, he wasn't shooting. He was panicking. He didn't know what to do because no one had ever confronted him like that. I wanted him to, I wanted him to kill me. 
I was tired of living, but I was afraid of dying. And then he called for a backup. When his backup came, I don't know what happened to the backup, but he must have had a heart or something. Because he, when he found out the situation, he said, can't you see this guy's crazy? I'm sorry we disturbed you. Let's go. And they left. And I just stood there. And I was so lost in the world that I was disappointed that he didn't kill me. That's how angry I was. And I was that angry at God, at this God that everybody believed in and I didn't. But God changed me, see? In a moment of time, when he filled me with his spirit, he took all that hate out. All that animalistic, demonic, devilish hatred of everybody and everything because I hated me. When you hate yourself, it's easy to hate God. But when God comes with love, see, I challenge God if you're real, you know, let's, let's, let's get it on. And God came. But God didn't come with this. God came around the back with love. I wasn't expecting that. See, I was expecting a fight. I was ready to fight, to deal, to throw down with God. And God came with love and I couldn't fight that. And he won me over that way through years of prayer. My brother interceding. My brother was a Christian. But here I am. Amen. Uh, did I answer your question? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that. Okay. Anybody else has a question? Tony, anybody? No? Okay. Okay, now we're going to go to the gifts of the, uh, the Spirit, uh, part two. We're going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 11. That's where we started. That's where these gifts we're going to talk about. Now, in the scripture, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are seen in three groups in this, in this uh, portion of scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 11. There's three groups of, of, of gifts. The gifts of revelation. The second one is the gifts of power. And the third group is the gifts of inspiration. So there's nine gifts listed here. There's three gifts of revelation, three gifts of power, and three gifts of miracle, of inspiration. Okay? Now we're going to go right to the first one. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. To what The word of wisdom is the supernatural revelation and ability to utter forth divine godly wisdom, listen to this, regarding the future. The word of wisdom has to do with what's going to happen, not what is happening now, not what happened yesterday, what is going to happen. The word of wisdom. I tell one of you that when you leave here, you're going to find your car on, uh, with no tires and somebody has crashed into your car and a policeman with, a, with one eye is going to be waiting for you. And his, his name is Charlie. OK, and you go out, you go out after the wonderful uh, time together as brothers and you see your car, everything that I said, see, that was a word of wisdom. It's about something that was going to happen, see? So that's what it is. It's the future purposes of God that is taken from the storehouse of God's own mind, see? It's a word. From who? From the Lord himself. And sometimes God wants to warn us, don't go that way, right? Like my friend, her mother told her, don't go that way. I had a vision that you should not go that way. So she gave her a word about the future event. And the daughter listened and was not killed. and was not taken captive or anything. So the word of wisdom has to do with the future event. The word of wisdom involves speaking the hidden things that we would normally not know. It's not something that is that is that we see. It's a hidden thing. And it says, it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, that very same chapter. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 2, 7, it says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto glory. See, it's the hidden things. And it says, in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, covered earnestly the best gifts. I think that that means the best gifts for you. One is not better than the other. It's what's the best gift for you in your life, by your experiences, according to your circumstances, according to everything that's happened to you. Wisdom, it, it means that this word of wisdom is a wisdom to learn, to apply the knowledge of the divine plan of salvation and the atonement of Christ previously hidden to the world. To the world, the, the, the cross of Jesus Christ is foolishness, but to us, it's the power of God unto salvation. Why? Because God takes the foolish things of the world to what? To confound the wise, you see? But it's hidden from them, like it was hidden from me. My mother was a Catholic. We grew up in the Catholic church, but I wasn't really a practicing Catholic. I never learned anything about Jesus. I didn't know God loved me. I thought God was angry at me all the time. 
That's the God I grew up with. He was always pissed off at me and he wanted to hurt me. You know what I mean? He wasn't a loving God. No one, no one ever told me that God loved me. No one. I have to find that out. Okay, so. Uh, through this gift of the word of wisdom, God makes you wise to the future. And you know what is going to take place so you don't have to worry about it. Why would God warn me about some futuristic event so I don't have to be anxious, so I don't have to be concerned, so it doesn't trouble me? See? You get a notice in the mail. We're foreclosing on your house. <laughs> God gives you a word. That's never going to happen. What do you believe? See? I call you up without knowing and say, God just spoke to me and he told me to give you this word. You're going to keep your house. Who do you believe? The foreclosure notice or the word of the Lord? Amen. So, so you don't have to worry about it or work to make it happen. Yes, Tony. I've had experience where um, I have to tell somebody who um, was anxious um, and I had to tell them that uh, get your life right or get your priorities straight because God is going to take your life. I had to wow. tell this person this. What would you say that was? Was that a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge or? I think I say, say it again. You said it was gonna gonna happen, or you said uh, it, it, it was gonna happen. happen. It was just a matter of time. Um, in fact, uh, this person, this person died about I say two weeks after I told him this. God mm -hmm. told me specifically to tell him. Then that would be um, a word of wisdom. Yeah. That would be a word of wisdom. Yeah, okay. because you told him about something that was gonna happen. You're gonna die. Yeah. You know, that's a big word, man. You better pay attention. Yeah. If I woke up to you, I said, listen, don't go down that street because you're going to die. And you say, ah, got to protect me. You know, that's what we do. We receive a word and we don't act on it. Prophecy is only wonderful when you act on it. Amen. How many people haven't received a prophecy and never acted on it? See, I told somebody, the Lord said that you have the gift of healings. And this person said, I know I do. They have never used it, Tony. Mm. In fact, they're backslidden today. Anyway, okay. So the word of wisdom is the divine communication and a message to the church from God given by the Holy Spirit through a believer. And it comes in things like this. In wisdom to receive and give a word about a divine and supernatural fact in the mind of God. See, it, it's in, in God's mind. He puts it in my mind. I give it to your mind. And you better mind, okay? See, the wisdom pertaining to future events and situations. Like Jesus tells the guys, uh, when you go outside, you're going to go to this street, the street called Straight, and you're going to find a fold that was never written. Tell them the master needs it. Now imagine I'm the guy that owns the donkey. And Tony's coming, okay? Tony and when one of the Jarvis is coming, okay? Jarvis is walking with a little cane. Tony has a funny hat. Right? They go in there and say, listen, the master wants your folk. And I go, get away from my property, man. See, that's the normal response, right? The man never complained. Take it. Jesus knew in advance, see? That's a word of wisdom. A word of wisdom. Go and find this. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be on a street called straight. Oh, boy. It's the Holy Spirit slapping somebody's face. Look, go to the spirit, the street of straight. When you're walking in straightness, okay, not crookedness. When you're walking in straightness, not crookedness, you can see God in action. So wisdom in dream interpretation, right? Somebody has a dream and you can interpret it like Daniel. Daniel interpreted that as guy, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, right? Those are the kind of things we're talking about. Wisdom to discovering the meaning of a mystery. Something is a mystery. Look, what happens? Daniel gives a word of wisdom in the interpretation of dreams. How so? Because the king says, oh, king, there was a cow. If one was a skinny cow, then one was a fat cow. This means what? There's going to be a famine. Look, here's the word of wisdom. There's going to be a famine. It's coming. If you don't prepare, you're going to wind up to be the skinny cow. And then he, he prepares and they survive. You see? That's the word of wisdom that was coming. So it's wisdom in managing the matters, the dealings, and the concerns and the activities of Christians. If uh, you're going to give a word of wisdom to somebody, it's for that, so that the Christian can better manage, the Christian can have a better life, so the Christian can make the right choices. It's wisdom 
to have devout and prudent, and I mean prudent, I mean farsightedness, planning for the future, to have forethought, so you can make the right judgment, you see, to have a discretion, so you can be cautious, to have shrewdness, so you can have practicality, and to have foresight with the unsaved too. So wisdom and skill in what? In imparting Christian truth. What does Paul say? I long to see you, that I might impart unto you some spiritual gift. See? Also, it's wisdom in interpreting divine things and human nature. Okay? And applying sacred scripture. It's wisdom to instruct the teachings of Jesus and to teach the plan of salvation to people. Like you said, warning them. Hey, if you don't do this, I see death person doesn't listen and they die okay the, the saddest thing is when i see a christian commit suicide like i have okay why because they didn't listen they received the word but they didn't act on it they didn't believe it wisdom informing and executing the counsels of god what is the counsel of god for you today in prayer that's where you find out the counsel of god for you the counsel of god for you is different from the counsel of god for me it's different for each other so you have to that's what prayer is for you find the counsel of god so the word of wisdom can be found in the Old Testament in certain places. One place he's found is in the story of Noah. God says, build an ark. There's a flood coming. That's a word of wisdom, see? So Noah takes 120 years, preaches for 120 years, and the only people that get saved are his family. What an unsuccessful preacher, right? <laughs> he preached to a congregation for how many millions of people? I don't know how many people in 120 years can you preach to. And none of them got saved. None of them. Listen, the only people that came into the ark was Noah's family, and that was on account of Noah, not on account of anything they did. See, it was his family. They went in the ark. It's also found in the story of Joseph, when Joseph interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh. It's also found in the visions, in the night visions of the book of Daniel. Like I said, those visions about the Antichrist and visions about the last days, visions about the eschatology. Those are all words of wisdom. And, and, and it's interesting because those are, chapters on the word of wisdom not just a sentence not just one word but chapters on the future of, of creation and the end times amazing and then also in the book of ezekiel the bible says that god took ezekiel by the hair and grabbed him and pulled him up into the mountains and the bible says he was angry imagine that god grabs you by the hair you got left imagine that okay and pulls you over the mountains i don't have any i don't have any here that's right. Well, God will pull you by your ears then, Tony, okay? <laughs> or by the back of the scruff of your neck, you see? Mm -hmm. So in the book of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel was caught into the spirit, chapters 8, uh, 38 and 39, see? That's what God gives him a word of wisdom on what's going to happen. Also in King David's life, God spoke a word of wisdom, Psalm 2, mm -hmm. Psalm 22, which speaks about the Messiah's suffering, etc. Also in the book of Joel, like we read, chapter 2. Also in the book of Isaiah. What do you think chapter 53 of Isaiah is? Yeah. But the suffering servant, the Absolutely. man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, you see? That's also a word of wisdom about someone who hasn't been born yet. 700 years before Jesus was born, okay? Isaiah spoke about him. All words of wisdom in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the word of wisdom is found in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Matthew 24, in Luke 21, and Mark 13. Don't worry, Tony, I'm going to send you the scriptures, okay? And also in the epistles of Paul, Acts 23, and 1 Peter, 2 Peter to the church, where Peter speaks about the end times, where there will be fervent heat and the elements will melt. That literally means that the air, the oxygen will melt. Anybody here been in the military? One of my specialties in the military was radiobiological warfare. And you did, uh, we discovered that uh, when, uh, when an H-bomb is dropped, right, at ground zero, in a nanosecond, the atmosphere has changed to 10,000 degrees and the air melts. The very oxygen itself melts, vaporized. That's what Peter was talking about 2,000 years ago, about the air being vaporized by the heat that comes from the end times when that's going to come upon creation. Those are words of wisdom. <clears throat> now we're going to go to the second. That was the word of wisdom. Now we're going to go to the word of knowledge, okay, which is a little different. The word of knowledge is supernatural inspired utterance of divine facts, okay? And they can sign signify certain things. 
One thing it signifies is the knowledge of God as offered in the Gospels. See, the word, of, the word of knowledge comes and gives us that knowledge, especially in Paul's exposition of it in 2 Corinthians. Paul talks about the things of God, the, the knowledge of God, knowing God. The knowledge of things that belong to God, such as intelligence, understanding, when you give somebody a word. Like you, one time I was walking to a, a fellowship, it was winter, it was cold, and I was walking, I was taking off my coat, and there was a girl sitting on a sofa. I'd never seen her in my life, never spoke to her. And I stopped and I said, the Lord will say to you that no man will ever hurt you again. She's got busted out crying. Why? Because she had just escaped to this fellowship from an abusive relationship. See, the word was for her to encourage her that God is interested in her. God wants to be intimate with her and God wants to include her. Amen? So, uh, also, the knowledge of the knowledge of faith. See, the word of wisdom gives the knowledge of faith, the deeper, more perfect, enlarged knowledge belonging to a more advanced look and understanding of the things of God. The higher knowledge of Christians and divine things, the word of knowledge is. The word of knowledge is used sometimes you will know somebody's name before you meet them. Sometimes you will know something about somebody and you're able to tell them, see, about them. I, I was evangelizing in the street one time and I saw a guy and sitting on a bench, and I walked up to him, and I grabbed him by both hands. He's a complete stranger. And I said, God wants to use these hands in music. And he said to me, how did you know that I was a musician? <laughs> See, it was a word. I got the word. And, and the word said, he's a musician. So go tell him this. And me being crazy Christian that I was, I told him this, okay? So sometimes God gives you a word to warn you also of danger. Or God will give you a word of encouragement when you're down, you know? Where, where can I go, to, you know, from King David? If you want to study depression, clinical depression, study the life of King David. There he goes. <laughs> study Jesus in Gethsemane, clinical, clinical depression, all the symptoms, okay? When Jesus was in Gethsemane, right? Get Shemen in the Hebrew. It means the place of the olive press, where they pressed olives in a vat. And the vat had holes, and they put jars. And when you pressed it with a big stone, the, all the olives, the oil came out. Why did Jesus go to past what they call in the Greek, the agonia. We get the word agony, right? He went to a place where they crushed olives and oil came forth. Look, look, look at the symbolism. And he was crushed in the place of crushing so that all oil of the Holy Spirit can come. Super symbolic, see? The agonia. In fact, that's a, a, a word that appears for the first time in the Greek language. It never appeared before. It was a, a word that the Holy Spirit made up to describe the suffering. When Jesus was thinking about his agony, thinking about the cross, thinking about all the sin, it just crushed him. See, the same way the olive is crushed and oil comes forth, Jesus was crossed, crushed, and the Holy Spirit comes forth. The get your man. Hallelujah. Praise God. Woo! Hallelujah. To the higher knowledge of Christian and divine things. Also, to, to understand moral wisdom, okay, such as right living. You know, you walk up to somebody and say, I remember one time this guy was having a sexual relationship with a girl in the church, and one of the ministers was coming by with his Bible, tucked his Bible tucked in under his arm, and he stopped like this. The person was right there, and he said, Stop your sexual sin. The person turned green when he said that and ran out. She started crying and ran out of the church, okay? Because God saw read her mail. We used to call it reading a mail, right? God, God didn't know her from Adam, okay? God said, Stop sinning sexually. Point that in front of everybody. Your sin will find you out, brother. Your sin will find you out. It's knowledge concerning divine things and human duties also. So what's the difference, ladies and oh, gentlemen, now today? What's the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Anybody want to take a crack at it? Yes, my brother. Ryan. Yeah, so with, see, th this whole sp speak on wisdom is kind of getting me a little confused because like, uh, okay. I feel like your wisdom is changing lanes right so it's got a little bit of prophecy in it a little bit of knowledge and a lot of other what i always thought wisdom to be was to be able to understand god's word or to be able to deliver it you know like okay. wisdom to to um to kind of um like see the me like a holy way of seeing the message being well like to doctor said i concur but this is the word of wisdom which is different the okay. word of wisdom is about I give you a word about something in, the fu in your future. While the word of knowledge is, I know that you have three kids. 
Or I woke up to you and said, do you have a son named John? You say, how did you know that? God told me, see? That's a word of knowledge. Very different. It's about now. The word of wisdom is about now and maybe yesterday. Where I woke up to you and said, uh, you know, you grew up an orphan, but God says that he has adopted you into the kingdom. See? I didn't know you were an orphan. But right. that's a word of knowledge for you. To let you know that God is real. God is moving in your life. That's why I come to you with a word of knowledge. That's not about your future. If it was about your future, then that, that would be a word of wisdom. It's different from wisdom, spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom is what you were talking about. But a word of wisdom is different. A word of wisdom can be like, you know, it could be a warning. I mean, but it could be something about your future. But a word of knowledge is that I walked into prison one time, right? I was, uh, doing a, I was a speaker in a prison. And I think it was Sing, Sing Sing up in New York. Anyway, when they, when they said, well, Pastor Zapata's here, and I was coming up the stage, right? There was a bunch of brothers and uh, prisoners in the front row. And I pointed to one of them as I'm walking up and I shouted out to him. I said, listen, brother, think, give me a number from one to 10. Think of a number one to 10. Don't tell me what it is. So he looked at me. I said, you got the number? He said, yes. I said, the number you're thinking of is nine. He said, how did you know I was thinking of nine? And from there, I had his attention. You see? From there, I had his attention. And I was able to give him other words after that. But first, I need to get your attention. So when God wants to get your attention, he might send somebody to you. Somebody might call you. The night I was going to kill myself, the night I was going to commit suicide, the night when my ex-wife had left me with the kids and it was raining and I trashed the apartment and I was punching walls and breaking things and screaming and cursing at God. I wanted to kill myself. I picked up a knife, a big knife, and I was about to slice my own throat. And when I raised the knife up, I couldn't. It was like a hand pushed me down. And every time I put a hand was pushing me down. And that made me more angry. And I was screaming and cursing. And it was thunder and lightning outside. And don't forget it. The, the, the windows were open. The wind was blowing in my house. Rain was coming on the floor. And I was just angry, shouting, screeching. I was so mad. And then the phone starts ringing. And it's ringing and it's ringing. And finally, I got so mad that I take the phone. In those days, we had the phones connected to the wall. Remember those, Tony? <laughs> and I took the phone and I tore it off the wall and I screamed and I cursed and I said, who is this? And it was my brother, the pastor. And this is what he said. Angel, don't do it. And I stopped and he said, don't kill yourself. God just spoke to me and said you were going to kill yourself. I could not believe that God cared enough about me that he would send my brother who lived in the Bronx and I lived in Queens and he was telling him, wake him up and say, angel's about to kill himself. I was so shocked by that, that I couldn't believe it. My anger just left. I was in such shock because I didn't believe God. He had been praying for me for 12 years. That's a word of wisdom. That came right from God. It saved my life. And he said, I'll be there in 20 minutes. And he was. And I never went back to the house again. I left with the clothes on my back. Nothing else. And I went to a very ugly divorce. And then I, to the kind graces of Christians who gave me a place to stay and gave me food when I couldn't find a job. I lived there for a year and a half through grace and mercy. But God saved my life. So I know what the word of wisdom, a word of knowledge is. And some of us need a word of knowledge to protect us, to prevent us from doing stupid things. You know what I mean? Anyway. The difference between wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom is the skill which regulates the Christian life. If I have wisdom, it helps me with my Christian life, like you were talking about, Brother Brian. That's wisdom, see? While knowledge is the insight into divine things. See? I have insight into the divine, okay? I walk by somebody and all of a sudden I stop and I say, come here, brother, I need to pray for you for this reason. And I pray. Oh, my God. One time I was in church. This is so funny, Barney. Uh, Bar Barney, I don't want to Barney. My good friend Barney, um, Tony. They, they, I, I'm, at, I'm in front of the. Uh, when we were in church, they kept us in the front, the ministers, to, to, to minister to the people when they came up for prayer. So then one of the deacons comes up to me. She says, "There's a person here that needs prayer, and I don't know what to do about this person." So I said, "Okay, who is it?" And they, brought, they brought this woman forth, and she was with her boyfriend. And so then, I, I just looked and I said, "I'm going to pray for you now, okay? But first, we got to talk about some things." And then I start to tell her about her life. This is what's going on in your life. This is what's happened to you. These are the things. 
And as I started saying these things, she starts sobbing and crying. And then I said, and the devil appeared to you in your house. When I said that, she fell apart to me, screaming. How did you know? How did you know? She was just screaming and sobbing. and just sob She needed God to, to, to tell her all about herself. And that's why they brought me over so that God used me to tell this girl, God knows everything about you. There's no secrets. And I said, and see this guy you're with? Stop having sex with him too. She, she was a mess. She was a total mess. Yes, Tony. I had a situation when um, I was scheduled to pray for people on, on you know, I, I guess a year ago before the pandemic. Uh -huh. And uh, I had this young girl come up to the front. And she says, I, I need for you to pray for me. And before I even asked her what she needed for me to pray for, God spoke to me right away and told me she's sleeping with someone who's not her husband. Oh. And, but she wants to serve me. She's got to be able to make the decision in her life. So I told her, before you speak, could I please tell you something that God told me to tell you? I don't know you. You don't know me, but I'm going to tell you what God wanted me to tell you. What God wants me to tell you is that you're living with somebody who's not your husband. God loves you so much. He wants you to leave that relationship behind and come in and serve me. What'd she say? I can't do that. Then I told her harshly, I told her, I can't pray for you. Good. You did the right thing. I wouldn't pray, pray for her either. You. Why are you wasting my time? Yeah. Don't. You know, there's yeah. come to time when you say, you know what? Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet. They don't want my gospel. Shake the dust and move on. So there are times where as a minister, you hate to do it. But if someone, you know, if you want, if they come up for prayer, then they don't want you to pray about what God gives you for them. Then don't pray for them. Send them somewhere else. You know, sometimes the Bible says that Paul says, turn this person over to Satan. He's done such evil. He was sleeping with his own mother. Turn him over to Satan, but not so that Satan will kill him, but so that Satan will beat him up a little, send him back. See? And sometimes we as ministers, we got to send you back to Satan so Satan can kick your booty, okay? And then when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, you come back and God can help you. So the word of knowledge is related to facts. If a thing is knowledge, then it's not a mystery. You got that? If something is knowledge, then it's not a mystery no more. The gift of the word of knowledge deals with what exists whether it is in the past or in the present. In the word of knowledge, different from the word of wisdom, God reveals to one of your servants something that now exists or did exist in the past. That's why you can talk to somebody and say, you used to use drugs. Your father beat you. You have no relationship with your father, right? I was witnessing to a girl in my block one time. She, I saw her all the time. She would come out late, go into clubs, and she'd always say hi. I said, listen, I want to talk to you. Come over here. She came over. I think her name was Alice, if I remember correctly. And I said, Alice, God wants to tell you something today before you get to the club. She goes, what does God want to say? I said, God says this. He's your father. You've never known your father. This girl just starts crying right on the spot. Her mascara starts tripping. She said, you never knew your real father, but God wants you to know that he loves you so much. And he wants to be your father. You know, she never forgot that. See, those are the word of, of knowledge. The, the word of knowledge, that's what it's for. To encourage somebody, see? Also, okay, where else? In the word of knowledge, God reveals to one of the servants something that now exists or did not exist on the, or, or did exist on the earth. This must be something that the now the believing servant could not naturally know. See, it's something that his eyes have not seen. It's something that my ears have not heard. It's something that my mind has not realized. That's why they call it the word of knowledge from God. See, it's God's knowledge coming into my knowledge. Normally, it would have to deal with a need or an emergency. Sometimes it's an emergency. Hey, don't go that way. Don't go that way. That's a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, right? But if I'm telling you, I say, come over here, brother. I want to say something. God told me you have a gun in your pocket. Give me your gun. Don't go over there and shoot that person. How did you know that? See? So the word of knowledge can be found in the Old Testament in these stories, in the story of Elijah, when he said, you know, God, there is not another, uh, in the story of Elijah, when God, he said, you know, God, there is not another good man. This is Elijah saying. You know, God, there's not another good man living except me. What does God say? Yet I have left 7,000 just like you, brother. Here's a word of, wisdom, of knowledge, okay, right from God. You, you think it's poor little old you. He's feeling sorry for himself. God says, slap, slap. I got 7,000 more. Any questions? In other words, look, watch this. 
I can replace you really easy, okay, Mr. Prophet, okay? Be careful, don't get, don't get it twisted. Don't think because God uses you, you're somebody special, okay? Yes, Tony, you wanna to say something? Okay, uh, what it says, God, God says I have you have 7,000. And also the word of knowledge is found in the, in the story of Elisha when he rebuked Gehazi for taking money from Naaman, right? He says, Elijah says to, to Gehazi, did I not see the whole thing that happened? He wasn't there, but God showed it to him, see? And he said, because of that, now you're going to get the leprosy that Naaman had. How's that? Take that. He's also found in the book of Samuel, chapter 19, 19, 10, I'm sorry, which says, God told Samuel where Saul was hiding. See? God told him, Saul's over there hiding behind his thing. Also, that's, these are just examples. In the book of 2 Kings, where it is said that Elisha, the prophet, it says, the prophet that is in Israel, Elisha, tells the king of Israel the words that you spoke in your bedchamber, okay? Elisha was not in there, but Elisha knew the words that were spoken behind palace walls. The word of knowledge can be found in the New Testament in places like this, in the book of John, chapter 4, with Jesus and the woman at the well. Jesus said to her, you have had five husbands, and the husband you have now is not your husband. What did she say? He told me all that I ever did. Hallelujah. You see, the word of knowledge is for that, so that people can go, you told me everything. How did you, are you reading my mind? It's, no, it's not reading mine. That's not how the folks witchcraft stuff. This is the Lord speaking. The Lord knows your mind. And also found here, we see the function of the word of God's knowledge. Jesus knew fact after fact after fact of this woman's personal life. Talk about a word. He gives her a whole bunch of words, okay? In the book of the Acts, it's found, chapter 10, when Peter had a vision while in the city of Joppa, right, about the man named Cornelius who was in the town of Caesarea. The Holy Spirit of God spoke to Peter, it says, behold, three men are seeking you. He's on the roof. He didn't see the men come to the door. There was no doorbells. There was no ring device, you know? There was no clankety-clank. The Holy Spirit said, there's three people downstairs waiting to talk to you. Word of, of knowledge. Uh, now the next gift. So we spoke about the word of wisdom, which is about a future event. The word of knowledge is about the fact in the mind of God that God wants to share with you. Now we're going to go to the more difficult one, I think. Yes, Tony. Yeah, I, I had an experience, uh, God, years, decades ago with, uh, with um, Bishop Kaufman. Yes. I will actually... For, for a good two, three months, have all, all the preaching that he had prior to he, before he even preached, I had all of his three points. Wow. I would actually have someone witness the points. I would write down the points and give it to them. And I would have them sit in front in service in front uh -huh. of me. And as the points that I wrote down came to pass, uh -huh. she would turn around and look at me and say, oh, my God. <laughs> now, now, what is that? I, I, now, if it was a future thing about what he's going to speak in the future or the same day? Well, it, it, would, it would be that week. I would have the points, like, say, Tuesday and Wednesday, he would preach on a, on a Sunday. That would be closer to a word of wisdom because it was a future thing that did not happen yet. Wow. But the word of knowledge would be like if you woke up to him and say, uh, you're going to speak on this. One time a pastor was going to speak, right? And before he spoke, I stood up and gave a word. And I said, those that wait upon the Lord will renew the strength, something along that line. But we have to wait. And I repeated the word wait a couple of times. What did he preach on? The preacher, waiting on the Lord. It confirmed his message. That's a word of knowledge, okay? So now we talk about the word of uh, wisdom, future event, word of knowledge, fact in the mind of God. Now the discerning of spirits. There's a lot of misinformation about the discerning of spirits, okay? So the gift of discerning of spirits, plural, enables the possessor, that's me or you, to see through all outward appearances and know the true nature of what is being inspired, okay? The true nature, able to, somebody speaks a, a, a prophecy and you say to yourself, that's not God, see? You know that's not God, you know? I, the opposite of that is this. One time I was in church and a couple of prophecies were spoken and I said, you know, I, everybody's speaking pretty much the same prophecy. So the guy sitting next to me all of a sudden, Tony, he gets up. I can't make this up. Listen, he starts speaking in tongues in opera. Okay. 
like singing opera. And so I'm looking at him like absolutely flabbergasted. And then the word of the Lord comes out in opera. It was like, oh, blew my head, really. Wow. It was tongues in opera. And then the Lord will say to you, <laughs> crazy, brother. But it was a powerful, and it went along with the preaching. So you knew it was the Lord, see? Wow. So the discernment of spirits, see, I didn't have it that day. It blew my head, okay? So anyway, so what, what, uh, let's, before we say what the, let's, let's be like a Jewish rabbi today, okay? You come to the Jewish rabbi, you say, I want to become a Jew. I want to convert. He goes, you don't want to be a Jew. They hate us. They condemn us. You know, all this stuff. And then you say, oh, you walk away sad. Then you come back a week later. I want to become a Jew. No, you don't want to be a Jew. You don't want to go. He goes, sit. then third time you come, you say, I want to become a Jew. He goes, okay, sit down, listen. Okay. So before we talk about what the Holy Spirit, uh, the discernment of spirits really is, let's speak about what it's not. The, whole, the discernment of spirits is not the following. Okay. The discernment of spirits has no relationship to what is natural. It's spiritual. So it has no relationship to the natural. Okay. The discerning of spirits is not some kind of metaphysical, okay? That means abstract, theoretical, conjectural, philosophical, speculative operation. So it's not metaphysics, okay? The discerning of spirits, it's not mind reading, okay? That's what the, 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 the fake clairvoyants do. That's what the crystal ball readers do. That's what the people who are in Santerismo and witchcraft and all that stuff try to do. That's what the witch of Endor, okay? So, so comes disguised to seek the counsel of the witch of Endor and started re waiting for the Lord. And what does the witch do? She comes up a little water thing and all of a sudden, what happens? Boom, Samuel's supposed to come out and she gets frightened, why? Because she, she was gonna fake it and now something spiritual is really happening. You see what I mean? So the word of uh, the, the sermon of spirits, it's not mind reading, okay? The discerning of spirits is not psychoanalysis, okay? Where you examine, where you inquire, where you evaluate, where you do therapy, where you do treatment and psychiatric care. I'm a trained clinical psychotherapist, but when I counsel people, I don't use that, see? I have to use the gifts of the spirit to counsel people because I'm going to give them the Lord. The problem is always spiritual. I don't care what you're going through. The problem is always spiritual. So it's never the, the psych psychiatry, sociology, and any other ology other than theology is the answer. Now, the, the discernment of spirits is also not extrasensory perception, ESP. It's not thought transference. It's not telepathy. It's not the sixth sense, you know, like that movie, that show in the 70s, okay? The discernment of spirit has nothing, listen to this, to do with the realm, okay, of the mind. And that realm means the dominion, the kingdom, the empire, the territory, the jurisdiction of the mind, the sphere of the mind. That's not it either. The discernment of spirit is also not a clash of personalities. Tony has an argument with his wife. His wife says, you have a devil, leave me alone. See, that's the clash of personalities, all right? Sometimes wives do that, okay? They demonize us husbands when they disagree with us. Can I get a witness from anybody? I mean, hallelujah, praise God. Anyway, the discernment of spirits is not the gift of suspicion, okay? Suspecting a person of being a certain way when he is not that way at all. The discernment of spirit is also not now, listen to this. This is very difficult to understand, but it's really easy to understand. The discernment of spirits is not the gift of discernment. It's not that. The discernment of spirit, why? Because there's no such gift. There is no such gift to the Christian as the gift of discernment. Why? Because it's the discernment of spirits, not people. The discernment of the spirit in people. The discernment of the spirit tormenting. One time I was, I was a pastor, visiting pastor in my church. And uh, uh, there was a woman all the way in the back of the church. She was sitting by herself. And then he started preaching and he stopped. And he looked at the woman. He said, shut up. And she wasn't talking. So all of us like, like, why did he scream that to this poor woman? 
And then afterwards, we confronted him and said, why did you do that? This is what he said. I wasn't talking to the woman. I was talking to the spirit that was tormenting her. Discernment of spirits, you see? It's a discernment, not the discernment of, of, of things, it's the discernment of spirits. People get it twisted and they try to discern people. <laughs> they try to discern Tony and Angel and, and everybody, and Ryan and, and, and other people that they, they, they think they know things about. That's not it. The discernment of spirit is not a discerning of things. It's the discernment of spirit. Let's not get it twisted. Amen? That, is that clear? I don't want nobody to be confused. Okay. There are three areas in which the discernment of spirits can operate. Okay. The discernment of spirits can operate in the divine. In godly things, in heavenly things, in celestial things, in deific things. And also in the demonic, right? We recognize evil spirits, the devil, no less than the, the diabolical, the fiendish, the hellish, the infernal. The gift of discernment is not prime, but also this the gift of discernment is not, discernment of spirits, excuse me, is not the discernment of devils. But some people make it, that's all it's what it's about. They see a devil everywhere. You smoke a cigarette, you got a, a, a demon of cigarettes in you. you. You take a drink, you got the demon of, 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 of uh, crystal champagne in you. You know what I mean? Or you got the, 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 the demon of uh, 96 wine. You know, the wine when I was growing up would cost 69 cents a bottle, okay? We used to call it pluck, okay? Or fighting cock wine or Thunderbird. What's the word? Thunderbird. You know Thunderbird, say? Thunderbird. Orange rock and all them cheap <laughs> wines, you see? That's not the devil. That's not a devil. It's not a devil of cigarettes. You follow me? So if you if you say if you just say I have the discernment of spirits and you see a devil everywhere, that's not the discernment of spirits. Because the first devil you need to get out is the devil that's in you when you're saying stuff like that. Okay, so there's that the discernment of spirits can operate in, in the divine, in the demonic sphere, and lastly, in the human sphere. See, with someone uh, with, uh, what spirit is this person in now? You know, you're at home watching TV and God puts somebody in your mind. That they're going through something, see, and you call them, and they're down and out in Beverly Hills. You know what I mean? They're really going through some depression or something. What happened? You discerned that spirit in that brother. What the things that's bothering him, whatever it is that is that that depression, uh, suicidal ideation, okay, things like that. Those are the uh, uh, anger, okay. I mean, look at the guys in jail. Every person that was in jail was angry. That's how they got there. Some of them stay angry. They keep that spirit of, of murder with them. I know I visited them. I know I ministered to them. All kinds of murderers and everything else. And some of them kept that spirit of murder, that anger throughout the time in prison, and they died with it. And they died lost. Also, uh, the human being, the individual, the moral, social, or natural, physical, biological, environmental, ecological, geographical, etc., ordinary things, you have to be able to discern the spirit that is causing this, the root cause. Yes, Tommy. I had a encounter with many, many encounters. But one in particular, that was one one person that walked into our uh, to Love Gospel, mm -hmm. and um, I'm sure you know Sammy Malave. Yeah, Church. sure. Yeah, Sammy. And he asked me, he was the head of the, of the ushers, uh, head of, of security, and um, I was in uh -huh. the front. And he asked my wife, you know, to go go and um, talk to Sammy. He needed me for something. Anyway, I went back there. He said, listen, I'm having problems with this guy. And I right away, when I saw the guy, I knew he was being influenced by demons. I just, okay. I just knew it. God showed me. I don't know how. I just knew uh -huh. it. That's a discernment of spirits. And the discernment of spirit. Now, I didn't, I didn't talk to the guy. I talked to the actual yeah. spirit that was in it. Okay. And, and I said, you shall not do this in the house of the living God. You shall okay. not. And I want you right now to bend your knees. And the man started to bend his knees. Amen. And I, I think I said to, to the guys in class before, this guy bent his knees. He says, I won't come here again. I said, if you do come in here again, I will cast that out. And he got up and he left and Sammy Malave's mouth dropped. And, and wasn't amazed. I was not amazed at my what God, but just 
how God has shown me that. And I had not, it's not something I've been praying about. It's not something that I was looking forward to. Believe me, I, I didn't want to be bothered that day. It was a Sunday service. The place was packed. The last thing I wanted to do was go in the back. I just wanted to just, after teaching, I just wanted to relax and worship God. And this man came in and, and, and he was ruffled. He was, the guy was, a, he, you could hear him screaming from the back. And I, and I came and I said, you should not do this in the house of God. This is the place of God. You should not do this. Bow down right now. Bend your knees. And that man bent his knees. And I said, now get out. And Amen. he walked out. And everybody looked back. And I was just amazed at what God had done. God is good. No. Amen. God is good. God is good. Discernment of spirits. Amen. Now the discernment of spirits is, this is what it is. It's comprehending and understanding the human spirit. The kind of spirit a particular person possesses. What spirit you're in. I discern it. See? I'm walking by and I discern that spirit. And I'm able to tell you things. See? If I discern your spirit, I could, if probably, since it's a, a gift of revelation, I could probably use another gift of revelation, like a word of knowledge for you. And I could use the other gift of revelation, which is the word of wisdom. So they all work in conjunction. See, that's the whole thing. If you have the gift of discernment, it's for a reason, you see? I go to Puerto Rico and I, and we were gonna go to witness in another island off the coast of Puerto Rico. And the guys got up early, they were having to eat. And then when they were going in the restaurant, I didn't want to eat. So I waited outside and there was a guy there standing there and he said, he was begging. So I said, uh, so I said, well, what's going on with you? And I started talking to him. He said, can you give me 25 cents? I said, and talking to him, I said, no, but I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm a minister. I want to talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, and then God gives me a word, see? He gives me a word for the guy. And he, I said to him, you're having trouble with your, your stomach right now, aren't you? He goes, yes, how did you know? And so I started talking. I said, God wants to heal you right now, okay? God is, has, says he has power to heal you right now. And this is what he said. No, I don't want healing. I just want some money. That's what he said. And so what did I say? I say, I'm not going to give you the money and I'm not going to give you the healing because you didn't want it. Stay like you are, brother, but you will regret it. Okay. See, sometimes people don't want what God has. And you have to discern that too. See, the hardest thing I think I need to do as a man is discern what spirit I'm in every day. You know, some days you say, I had a good day today. I had a bad day today. That means I had a good, that good, happy spirit was with me. But the next day, a bad, depressing, lonely spirit comes out. You know what I mean? So it's, it's easy to, to discern your spirit, Tony. And somebody else's, but it's my spirit. Sometimes I got to discern myself. Anyway, moving right along. So the discernment of spirit is the divine ability to see the presence and activity of a spirit and, the, and how it motivates another person, whether good or whether bad. The discernment of spirits gives members of the body of Christ insight and into the what? Into the spirit world. See? It's a realm, it's not a realm of the five senses, okay? It has nothing to do with feeling, it has nothing to do with hearing, it has nothing to do with smelling, it has nothing to do with tasting, it has to do with insight into the spirit world. Right now we're here, I'm over here in South Carolina, you guys are up where you are all over the world, New York and other places, and what? There's a spirit world around us that unless God gives you that, the sight into it, you're not seeing. You're not seeing how many angels are surrounding my house right now. You don't know how many devils want to come in and they can't, you see? But in a moment of time, God can show me that. When my brother, Joe, when he was dying of AIDS in the hospital, and I and my other brother went to visit him, we're walking down the corridor to visit him in his room. And all of a sudden, we hear him screaming. So we start running. We didn't know what was wrong with him. We ran into the room, threw open the door, and my brother was on the bed going like this, no, no, no. And I said, Joe, what's wrong? And this is what he said, don't you see them? I said, who? He said, all the angels and the devils that are surrounding my bed and fighting for my soul. And that's what we started praying for him. And gratefully, he died saved. He died at 39 and he died in Christ. See, but he, when death was getting near, got insight into the spirit world that caused him to get saved. See, 
It was a spiritual experience given to a person who was not spiritual. Why? With the desire for God to save him. And God did. God saved him. Anyway. So. Uh, the spirit, okay. It has nothing to do with your feelings. Okay. It takes the gift of the discernment of spirits to what? To penetrate the dividing of soul and spirit, like Paul says. Well, what, how can I penetrate? How can I divide between soul and spirit? Only through the discerning of spirits within a person, okay? The discerning of spirits, the, book, the power of revelation, can bring tremendous inspiration to a church body when you see it happening. When you see it happening, you see? When a person comes to the church, falls on the floor, and starts sliding up the aisle like a snake, you know right away, demonic possession. You cast it out in the name of Jesus. Okay? So the discernment of spirit can bring tremendous inspiration. The discernment of spirit can produce a real spirit of security. See? Against what? False doctrine. Someone's teaching a false doctrine. You can say, no, that's a false doctrine. That's a lie. It's not what the Bible teaches. Okay? You discern that's a lie. See? You discern what the spirit he's coming is a lying, deceiving spirit. And you have that too. Against false doctrines, against lies, and all kinds of things that are not real. A lot of craziness is happening in the Church of Jesus Christ today, fellas. And we have to be, as leaders, we have to discern those things and bring correction immediately. Somebody's out of order, you got to put them in order. Or they have to leave. They can't be in the body of Christ. They're not going to participate. You know, if you want to act out as a demon, we're going to cast you out. I'm not afraid to do that. I cast seven devils out of a man. So I'm not afraid to do that. You see? And every time the devil flew out of this guy, he, he screamed like it was, you heard him in New Jersey. We were, I don't know where we were, in Pennsylvania, wherever it was we were. So that's what God wants us to do, use the gift. So the discernment of spirits can enable a church to choose the proper men and the proper women to fulfill the ministries within the church. Paul says, give me seven men filled with the spirit to wait on tables. See? Biblical examples of the discernment of spirits, Acts chapter 8. Simon the soothsayer wants to become a big man among the people. So he asked from the apostle Peter, can I buy the gift of the Holy Spirit so when I lay hands on people, they'll speak in tongues? Oh my God, what does Peter say? Your money perish with you. You know, keep your money and burn it out with it. You know what I mean? What, because you have thought that the gift of God can be purchased with money, he says. Yes, Tony. It, there's uh, this actual word in the Roman Catholic uh, uh, faith. It's called simony. Yes, Simon. Yes, the, the it's love of money. Simony. It's called yes, the simony because it's a person that wants to purchase something in order to get something spiritual. It has to do like the indulgences and in the yeah. church history. Yeah. Now, Peter's response was your money first, which so Peter was able to see what others could not see. Okay, and the motives behind it, the reasons, the causes, the purposes, the intentions. What's driving this guy to do it? See the aims. What's his need that he's saying this? That were in the that were in Simon the soothsayer's heart that they were evil and not of God. See, see in Acts chapter thirteen, Paul discerns the evil tendencies of Elymas the sorcerer, right? And the Holy Spirit blinds Elymas for his sin. In Acts chapter five, and Ananias and Sapphira, right? They come to Peter and says, "Did you give? Are you giving all the money you're supposed to?" He says, "Oh yeah, mm -hmm, I swear, I swear to God and the Virgin. You know what I mean? Pinky swear." And Peter says, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Boom, drop dead, boom, carry him out. Three hours later, I wonder what his wife was while he was being buried. Three hours later, she comes in. Did you give all the money? Oh, yes, yes, I, you dying too. The guys that, bring, that buried your husband are coming, they're going to bury you. And the Bible says, very, this, I crack up when I read this, and the whole church was afraid. <laughs> you know, imagine, you come up to me, you lie to me. I say, for lying to me, God's going to kill you right now. And I step back. Boom, you fall over. And the church was scared. Hallelujah. So in Acts chapter 5, lying to the Holy Spirit, okay? So the discernment of spirit is an excellent instrument to clean out the pulpits and the, and the pews of America, you know? Some people have been sitting in the pews so long, that's why maybe they call them pews, because these people stink spiritually, you know what I mean? And we have to take all those people that don't want to be there, that don't want to do the work of Christ, that, that, that are just want to be religious, have a religious spirit. We have to discern that too. Don't put them in places of power. The, and, and people that are lustful and fall in, in sexual sin. And like a big church, Hillsong just had a, a, a pastor fall. Uh, not once, but three different times. And they covered it up. 
how can I, and this is the reason they gave, because he's bringing a lot of money to the church. I would say, abolish the board, kick out all the pastors, close the church, start again. How's that? How's that for a discerning of spirits? <laughs> Hallelujah. So many pastors and church leaders today are engaged in sinful activities. And they are not right, honest, holy, or true. And no one is discerning. So it goes on for years, victim after victim. It's horrifying. So church members as well as are living in sin and doing things totally opposed to the will of God for their lives. Guy comes into my ministry when I was in uh, Celebrate Recovery, and he says, he comes up for prayer. I said, what do you need prayer for? He says, I need a job. And he comes up with this woman, the woman standing next to him. He's black, she's Spanish. And I say, uh, okay, so you need, you need a prayer for, for, uh, for, for to get a job? He goes, yes. And so I say, who's this that's with you? He goes, that's my girlfriend. I said, okay, you're not married, right? He goes, no, that's my girlfriend. I said, do you live together? And so he looks at her, she looks at him. He goes, yes. I said, are you intimate? So he goes, well, what do you mean by that? I said, are you having sex together? He says, he looks at her, she looks at him. Yes. I say, that's got to stop. Oh. He goes, why? I said, do you want me to pray for you to get a job? Yes or no? He goes, yes. I say, well, you got to promise me now, right now, God's presence, that you're going to stop this sexual relationship. And I told him this. I gave him a word of wisdom. In 12 days, God will get you a job. Do you believe that? He goes, yes. I said, okay, in 12 days from today, God's going to give you a job. But if you go back to sex with your woman, God's going to take the job away. So some days passed, and he comes in again, and he comes up for prayer again. And I say, hey, what's up? How, did you get that job? He said, exactly like you said, Angel, 12 days, I got that job. And I said, wonderful, praise God. And, he, and then he goes, but I lost it two days later because I found a sexual sin. <laughs> you know, people are people. People are crazy. They do some stupid stuff sometimes. He actually made me laugh. But you know, that relationship did not survive. And I knew it wouldn't survive. And they eventually broke up, see? And they went their separate ways because it was damaged from the beginning. And you can't come up there and mean sexual sin and ask, ask God to bless you. And so people do. They have all these secret sins. They cheat on their taxes. They cheat on their wife. They're looking at porno. You know what I mean? They're going to, to massage parlors. They're doing all this crazy stuff. And then they think it's a big secret. Nobody knows. And then God exposes them. And then their ministry is destroyed. People are injured, wounded. They turn their backs on Christ on account of you not being in your place. So church members are living in sin and doing things totally opposed to the will of God for their lives. To the discernment of spirits, we can have a holy church without spot and without wrinkle. The discernment of spirits is the gift that enables one to appraise a situation, assess it, evaluate it, judge it, review it, consider it, and its motives too. The motive behind everything that you do is more important, I think, than the thing you do. See, what I think is what I feel. What I feel is what I do. So if I think lust, feel lust, I do lust. See, if I think holy, I feel holy, I do holy. Because you can't give what you don't have. The discernment of spirit gives the believer power to see what others cannot see from the spirit world. Through the gift of discernment of spirits, we can discern the similitude. And what I mean by that is this, the likeness, the resemblance, the sameness, the uniformity, the equality, right, of God, the risen Christ, the Holy Spirit and the cherubims, and the seraphims, and the angels, see? We can see angels. Why? Because people in the Bible saw angels. Angels visited them, right? When my father had died, and we went to church, and the, the, they had the body in church, and they were about to bring them in service, I was a little overwhelmed, so I went outside. Now, my father came to the Lord at 82. He lived to be 96. But my father never went to church. He didn't read the Bible, to my knowledge, anyway. Okay, so I'm, I went outside because I was thinking to myself, I wonder if God, my God, if my father made it. Is my father with you? I'm thinking this, right? I'm saying, God, is, is my father with you? Because I never saw him read a Bible or pick up a, a scripture or go to church. And then all of a sudden, there's this bum across the street. He's walking in a corner. He's looking at all the garbage cans, I guess, for food. 
He's passing by all the garbage cans and he's coming, coming right across. Then he stops directly across the street from where I am. The hearse is on that side over there. And then he looks at the hearse and he says, he turns to me and he says, did someone die? I said, yes, my father. And this is what the bum tells me. Your father is in glory with Jesus. He said, it's like that. And so that's what I was thinking. So it really blew my head. Talk about a word of knowledge, right? And then I said, you have to come and tell my brothers. And when I turned around, he was gone, Tony. He was gone. See, but God had to tell me, your father is with me. See, I kept him just like you said. And so I knew that moment that my father is with God. See, even though I never saw an outward thing of it, but his heart was right with God when he died. Hallelujah. So where am I? Okay. Oh, so see, they talk about, you can see angels, you can see archangels, which are warrior angels. Yes, Tony. Yeah, I want to uh, talk about the experience I had really quick. I yes. was going to, um, I think I told the guys, I don't know if I ever told you, I was going to Christian Pub. This is a place where they have books downtown, 43rd Street. Yeah. And I remember um, I had just gotten saved. I, I was saved maybe about a month. And I was walking down, and um, I bumped into this lady. Uh, she seemed like a German German woman, heavy set. Uh huh. And I was just, in my head, I was just thanking God for salvation. I was just, you know, jubilant. I was just happy. It was a Friday night. It was, Amen. And I'm walking, and I, and I passed by, and I bumped her by mistake. And I said, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. And she turns around. She goes, you're a servant of God. Blessed be the servant of the Lord. Amen. And as I walked and to turn around to see her there, she was gone. Hallelujah. She was gone. Bible Who says, yeah, who you meet, you might meet an angel. And the cherubims, cherubims are also a special type of angels. But I like my favorite type of angel, believe it or not, is a seraphim found in Isaiah chapter six with six wings. All they do is burn with love for God. I want to be like that. I want to just burn with that fire that burns but does not consume the love of God. I just want to, I want to be say holy, holy. Holy is the Lord of hosts. See, I don't need no discernment. I know that's a fact, but I can discern it also. See, that I would like to be visited by a, a seraphim who, who just stood there like Isaiah saw him saying, holy, 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 burning with love, bro. For eternity, that, that's their ministry, Tony. They burn with love for God. Hallelujah. So by the gift of the discernment of spirit, we can also discern, decide, conclude, resolve, establish, settle, agree, and finalize the spirit of Satan when we see it and the spirit of evil so we can defeat them. And I'll end with this. So we must be willing for the gift of the discernment of spirits to function in its fullness among us so that God can get the glory and we can learn to live to please him. That's what the gifts are for, to please God, see? We talked about three three gifts tonight, book uh, gifts of revelation in 1 Corinthians 12. And they are the word of wisdom having to do with a future event, the word of knowledge having to do with the fact of God, and the discerning not of people, of not of situations, but of spirits. What are the spirits? It's a, it's a look and a peek into the spirit world. What's going on that we can't see right now, okay? How does a man walk into a place and kill his whole family? There were spirits involved in that, see? How does a man stick a knife in somebody and walk away and eat breakfast right on top of the corpse? Oh, those things. There were spirits, see? They were possessed and they were also hearing voices that were telling them to do these terrible things. So had, had someone discerned that, perhaps, maybe he could have got the help that he, he needed. But let's pray for the be used in these gifts this week. Amen. Let's pray that we use the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge and the discerning of spirits. Let's, let's, let's hope that... that, that my, that like my brother, that a word of knowledge that saved my life. Let's hope that we can save somebody's life one day. Hallelujah. You know, later on, later on as a Christian, I got a call from someone that I knew, and she was suicidal at one o'clock in the morning. And I remember my own battle with that. And I was able to minister to her for two hours on the phone so she got the help that she needed. And today she's married, she has children, she's serving the Lord. See, my brother rescued me, and I was to help someone to rescue her. But it was God doing the rescuing, see? Using vessels. 
Now, I, I'll end with this. There's two kinds of vessels in the church, the Bible says. Vessels of honor and mm -hmm. vessels of dishonor. They're both Christians. The vessel of honor is the vessel you pour your wine into, your drink that you drink from. The vessel of dishonor is the bedpan. <laughs> okay, look, in the church, listen to me, fellas. There's two kinds of vessels. The vessel of honor and the bedpan. Which one do you want to be? Do you want to take all the excrement on the church and put it in your pan? All the urine and the waste and vomit and everything else? Or do you want to drink from the cup of life? See? Man. Jesus said, if you drink from this, you'll never thirst. And out of your, your belly shall come living waters. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, oh God. I pray right now that my brothers will remember the words spoken to them tonight from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, oh God, of the gifts of revelation. Father, I pray right now that you will use these brothers in the word of wisdom, oh God, that they will be able to give facts, oh God, about the future to somebody, oh God. So give a word about something that's going to happen to warn people, to rescue them, oh God, from suicide and from homicide and from, from depression and from going over the top, oh God, and doing the wrong thing, oh Lord. I pray that they will be as intercessors, oh God, as they use that gift and use it in their families, use it with their loved ones, and use it with strangers, oh God. I pray right now that you will use them in mighty ways as the revelation gift of the gift of the word of wisdom. I pray, oh God, that my brothers would also be using the word of knowledge, oh God, for the word of knowledge shocks people. It stops people. It, it makes people start thinking, maybe there's something true here. Maybe there's something real here. Maybe what Jesus said was true. Maybe the word is true. Maybe the spirit is true. Maybe Christ is true. Maybe the Father is true. Maybe salvation is true. Father, I pray right now that you will use my brothers also in the word of wisdom, oh God, knowing facts that are only in the mind of God, oh Lord. And lastly, Lord, I pray for my brothers that they will use and they will be able to have the spirit, the discerning of spirits, oh God. Not the discernment of our people, but discernment of what spirit is troubling my brother and sister. What spirit does that person have? What spirit is he coming to with this thing that he wants to tell me? What spirit is the pastor speaking from? What spirit is the, is the teaching coming from? What spirit am I in today, oh God? I pray that you will use them in powerful and mighty ways this week. And that we will get reports next week of how God has used them, oh Lord, in mighty ways. Let them know, oh God, that if they have faith, oh God, if they'll trust you, there is no limit. Because you say greater things than this you will do. So I pray that all my brothers will do greater things, oh God, than all of us have ever done, oh God. That we will do more things greater than, than we've done before, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Pastor, would you just pray for Guy and his recovery again? Yes. Of course, please. Thank Bob, you. Guy? Yes. You're the guy. Remember that. You're the guy, guy. Okay? <laughs> and we guys are going to pray for Guy, okay? Because you're a good guy, right? Father in heaven, thank you for my brother. I pray right now, oh God, that just like the man who had that, that problem in the temple, oh God, the Bible says that they prayed for him. And when God healed him, he was jumping and leaping and praising God. So I pray you put my brother, do? Guy, to yeah. be jumping and leaping and praising your name, oh God. And he will be a witness there, oh God, to all the people that don't know you, oh God. That the Spirit of God will fall upon him in a mighty way with power and anointing regarding the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discernment of spirits, oh God. That he's your minister. I pray you will release him there, oh God. For you have him there for a reason, and it's not so much for himself as for other people that he will meet. Let him minister your love, oh God. Your power, your grace, your salvation, your rescue, your healing, oh God, your goodness, your holiness, your mercy, and your wisdom, oh God. I pray in Jesus' name for him to be the man of God that you call him to be, and a man of love, a man of prayer, a man of worship, the man of praise, a man who believes what no one else does, oh God. Send your healing touch so no one to be a party in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, guys. I appreciate Amen. that. Thank you. Amen. Any other questions, Tony? Anybody? Any questions, Brian? You know, I, I, you know, I, I often work when I work with the police department. I come in contact with a lot of police officers, detectives that are out there working hard and have experiences that were beyond their scope. Sure. Um, and I often told him, I often told him, I said, you know, that sounds extremely demonic. It does not sound, and they will brush it off. 
And then years later, they would come to me and, you know, you know what well, I talked to you about, you know, that guy committed suicide. And it's only now that I, I feel that it was demonic. There you go. And I said, I, I gave you that information, be, not because I wanted to prove you wrong. Okay. Right. In, in your, in your in span your of, of work in the police days. department, but to let you know that we're made of like something that? greater than just the physical. Amen. You know? And he thanked me for it. You know, um, he's recently serving God. I, he's in another state. And he's recently serving God. Praise God. But we often, when we see each other, we talk about that. You know, how he felt that way then and how he feels about things now. Amen. You know? that, that shows that you're growing, that you feel different. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You're growing. You know, we're, we're called to grow. Okay? We're called to grow in Christ, not to stay the same. December 15th. You shouldn't be the same Christian you were last week. You should have a little something extra this week. Learn something new. Learn a new scripture. Learn something new about the word. Learn something new about Christ. Learn something new about yourself. About your loved ones, you know? About the plan of salvation for you. What does God want to do with you? Let him do it. Will it be painful? Yeah. Like Mr. T says in Rocky Three, they say, what do you predict? He goes, I predict pain, okay? <laughs> well, I'm telling you as a minister, I predict pain, but I also predict blessing. I also predict joy evermore. I pray that you can leap and jump and praise God. You really can, even after divorce, even after losing a job, even after declaring bankruptcy, even after the, everything you have has been taken away, there can still be joy. Because joy comes from God himself, yeah. from being here. You know, the Bible says, if my mother and my father forsake me, the Lord lifts me up, you know? So God always is the lifter of my head. And he's never failed me yet. Because he's, that's not his function, see? I failed him. He never fails me. Never, ever. He never has. And I rejoice, my brothers. And I pray that you will grow and we could take it from here somewhere else, you know. There's, there's still a couple, like 18 more weeks, right, Tony? <laughs> One more week. One more week. But uh, I'm going to tell you something. I want to thank you again for uh, accepting to teach us. Because I know it's not something that you just just say yes to, that you pray about. You but, um, you pray were, about your prayers were pretty quick. So yeah, I was yeah. very thankful to to know that you was going to, to uh, uh, teach teach, and teach Amen. in a matter of, of what we needed to learn about. Amen. Listen, I, I learned, I'm a teacher, I'm a deacon in my church, Amen. but I'm never outside of learning more. Uh, my experiences are somewhat, you know, vast, but even in that vastness, is limited because uh, there's so many other things that other people are, are, have gone through. And I, I just want to be thankful for my friend and pastor, Angel Zapata. So with that, I bid you guys good night. Good night, brothers. Guys, good night. I'll call you uh, not tomorrow. I'll let you rest and all that. I'll give Thank you a call, you. Uh, I think, what, tomorrow's Wednesday. I'll call you Thursday just okay. to see how you're doing. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and of course, we'll keep in touch on Texas. Yeah, and, right. and call each other, brothers. Call each other. Yes, absolutely. We hold each yeah. other in prayer. We we text each other. Uh, on in harvest, I, I want to thank you again for being here. I know it's a sacrifice. You have a couple of things on the burner, so thank you very much, guys, and God bless. Have a good night. Good night, have a good night. Good thank night. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you, guys. No All problem. Right.